thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the, the, some of the changes, I think, that are happening in the, in the perception of genetics and ways in which it can be used and, and will be used over the next decade to improve uh, prevention and treatment of, of type 2 diabetes. So first of all, in terms of conflicts, quite a lot listed there, but I don't think they're disclosures, I don't, they're conflicts, because I'm really not going to mention drugs at all. Uh, part of the reason for putting up that full list, though, is just to indicate, I think, the increasing interest of pharma in human genetics as a way of identifying new targets and also understanding how better to use existing drugs uh, to, to manage uh, diabetes. So... Genetics is only part of the answer, of course, for type 2 diabetes. We've heard eloquently from, from Dinky, and as you all know, um, environment and lifestyle plays, plays an important role, but to anybody exposed to a particular environment, a particular lifestyle, uh, the genetic um, set of variants that you have, that you've inherited from your parents, plays an important role in, in, in uh, your reaction to that environment and the ultimate impact that will have on risk of common diseases such as type 2 diabetes. So understanding that genetics component is, is useful in itself, but it's also uh, pretty useful as a way of understanding what the fundamental events are that lead to a disease like diabetes so that we can use that enhanced mechanistic knowledge uh, as a way of uh, furthering our translational goals. And that's really what I'm going to uh, talk about. So I'm going to give you a very brief update on where we stand with the genetics of type 2 diabetes and then really take you very quickly through four use cases of the ways in which uh, human genetics can uh, deliver a better mechanistic understanding of diabetes, help us identify modifiable risk factors, and then get on to the question of individual prediction of risk and, and personalized medicine. So on this slide is summary of the last 20 or 30 years of the genetics of type 2 diabetes. Let me just take you through it a little bit for those that aren't familiar. What we're really looking for when we're looking for genetic, uh, the genetics of type 2 diabetes, we're trying to find sites of genetic variation that alter in, an individual's risk of a disease like type 2 diabetes. And those genetic variants can be rare in the population, or they can be common and shared amongst um, many members of a population, uh, maybe shared uh, across the globe. And they can have a pretty small effect on disease risk, or they can have a pretty big effect on disease risk, or anywhere in between. And up here in the top left-hand corner are the very rare variants with quite big impact on disease risk. Those are the ones that drive Mendelian forms of disease, MODI, uh, neonatal diabetes, depending on how you count it, 20 or 30 or 40 uh, such genes implicated. What we've been able to do over the last 10 or 12 years is start screening the whole genome for, for these sites of variation. And for technical reasons, it was easier to start with a common uh, uh, variation. And that's really what these genome-wide association studies have done over the last 10 or 12 years, finding four, more and more sites in the genome uh, that are significantly associated uh, with type 2 diabetes. We now have about 400 of those scattered across the genome. Common variants have been around in our populations for a long time. That's why they've quite common. They've had chance to rise from the first mutation that occurred in somebody. They've managed to sweep through the population to reach more frequency. Therefore, it's not surprising that they tend to have pretty modest effects. If they had big effects, uh, then they would have tended to have been weeded out. So these tend almost always to have uh, pretty modest effects. There are some examples of common variants in some populations that are associated with diabetes that have risen to high effects in a uh, celebrated example in Greenland, for example. But mostly these are pretty small. The bit in between is an area that we haven't really been able to get access to until recently, but with more and more sequence data arriving, we've started to understand what's going on here. So we now have a pretty good palette of uh, genetic variation that's significantly associated with different types of type 2 diabetes, and we can ask how that can help us uh, further our translational goals. And it can do it really in two ways. One of them is the, uh, by identifying a genetic variant that's uh, influencing risk of diabetes. If we can understand what it's doing, we get some generic insights into type 2 diabetes that may be useful for, for all patients, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then what I'll talk about later, as I said, is the, the idea of using individual knowledge of an individual's genetic variation as a tool for precision medicine. So just to tackle uh, the, the, the stuff on the left uh, briefly, uh, 
we have 400 uh, signals for, for type 2 diabetes. Some of those sit right in the middle of genes, and that's really nice and easy because then we can say, well, that gene is almost certainly involved in diabetes risk. Most of them sit in between genes in the uh, bit of the genome sequence that's associated with regulation. So then it's a bit trickier to work out which gene it's operating through. But we're making significant progress now, and there's a scratch list I, I uh, uh, keep track of with about 60 or 70 genes on it now that we have uh, shown are causally related uh, to type 2 uh, diabetes pathogenesis. Amongst them, you'll see uh, some known drug targets, PPR gamma for thiazolidine dyes, KCNJ11 uh, for sulfonylureas, a few of the incretin uh, related genes as well. So it's interesting to see that many of our known drug targets are represented on here by genetic variants that I guess if we uh, hadn't already known those, those as drug targets, uh, that would be starting to dawn on us. And so hopefully, the, hopefully the, the, the analogy is that amongst this longer list, there are going to be some other uh, potential drug targets in there uh, that will be amenable to drug developments and potentially provide some new additional classes of therapy. A, a nice example of that is this gene called SLC30A8, which is uh, discovered about 12 years ago in one of these early genome-wide association studies, one of the relatively rare examples where uh, a, it was a coding variant that was responsible, so we knew immediately which gene was involved. And it was a gene that, by which something was known about. It encodes for a zinc transporter that's only expressed in the pancreatic beta cells. And so uh, you can easily think about how that could relate to insulin granule stabilization and so on. So that became an, uh, an interesting target for, for therapeutic development right from the get-go. What was unclear, though, was whether you needed to upregulate it or downregulate it. You might have thought that uh, probably the, the disease was coming about through downregulation. You might need an agonist. Um, some of the mouse model data were a bit, a bit confusing in that respect. But as more and more sequencing was, was done, uh, people identified these really rare protein truncating variants. So that's variants where the, the gene is cut off halfway along, therefore associated with re clearly reduced, reduced function. And those were universally protective. So that uh, confirmed that actually it was loss of function that was protective, and therefore, if you wanted to uh, harness that as a therapeutic uh, target, you'd need to have an antagonist. Uh, and many companies are trying to, to uh, develop those at the moment. The other nice bit of uh, using human genetics is you can take people who've got these uh, protein truncating variants, you can have a look at them and ask whether they're suffering from any other disease, because clearly if they would, that might give you some harbinger of what a therapeutic uh, achievement of a similar effect would, uh, would achieve, and that might, of course, discourage you from uh, developing it. It turns out to be very clean. There are no other phenotypes associated with it, making it an attractive target. Um, other examples, the PCSK9 example, perhaps the most celebrated, not in diabetes, of course, but evidence that uh, African Americans, about 2%, carry a, a variant uh, that's associated with uh, loss of function of one copy of PCSK9. They have lower uh, cholesterol levels. They're pretty much uh, protected against myocardial infarction. Uh, and that was, of course, the motivation for the very rapid then development of PCSK9 inhibitors uh, over a less than 10 year period. And this, well, another way we can use human genetics is uh, perhaps rather paradoxically to understand the environmental factors better. Uh, as we heard from Dinky, and as you all know, um, the, the rising prevalence of type 2 diabetes is ascribed to. Westernization, coca colonization whatever term you want, a whole package of highly correlated behaviors and exposures uh, that are rather hard to disentangle epidemiologically just because they so much travel together. In fact, all of these at some point or other have been implicated as one of the causes of uh, type 2 diabetes. But of course, it's really hard to disentangle those epidemiologically. Genetics can help you do that sometimes. Uh, there's been long-standing dispute about whether low vitamin D levels are really causally related to type 2 diabetes. There's no doubt that there's an epidemiological association. Low vitamin D seems to go with higher rates of uh, type 2 diabetes. You can tackle, but is that confounded? Is it causal? You can tackle that using genetic variants that influence vitamin D levels. There are quite a lot of those knocking around that affect vitamin D uh, creation or metabolism and effectively give you a randomized control trial of a group of people who live their lives with high vitamin D and a group of people who live their lives with low vitamin D 
that won't be uh, confounded by other, other uh, epidemiological variables. And you can ask whether those two groups differ with respect to re uh, risk of diabetes. And in most of the studies, they don't. So there's an epidemiological association, but it's not causal. And that fits with the randomized control trials that have generally shown that vitamin D supplementation doesn't do much uh, for diabetes. So let's talk about uh, the other half of the precision medicine uh, half. Now, you know, you, we all know that diabetes is a very heterogeneous uh, condition. And we're all used to the idea maybe of, of thinking maybe about type 2 diabetes as a dustbin diagnosis after everything else has been taken out of the equation. And if only we were clever and smarter and knew more, we'd be able to take type 2 diabetes and divide it into you know, 10, 20 different uh, distinct subtypes, each with its own natural history, each perhaps with its own management uh, uh, and therapeutic optimization. And so we can ask, you know, is, th is that a realistic model or not? Uh, but before I come back to that question, that's the question I really want to pose, um, I'm going to take you to an area where that model does work, and that's monogenic forms of, of diabetes. As you know, there are many different types of uh, maturity onset diabetes of the young, and these are discrete, sufficient, and necessary causes of diabetes in many families. You can see the segregation through uh, through families nicely. Individuals who've got one form don't generally have another form because they're individually rare. And it's now, as you know, standard of care. If you see somebody presenting uh, with a likelihood of uh, uh, one of these monogenic early onset forms of non-insulin dependent uh, diabetes, to maybe get on your, your smartphone and uh, fill in a few questions to see if they're likely to have um, monogenic diabetes. And if so, send the sample off uh, for genetic testing. And it's both uh, effective and gives you an answer as to whether they do have MODI or not. And it does matter in terms of therapy. Um, uh, some of you will know that H individuals with HNF1-alpha uh, mutations are particularly sensitive to sulfonylureas, an observation that's been confirmed through randomized controlled trials, for example. And if you identify such an individual, it's natural uh, to place them on sulfonylureas, and you'll have a, a pretty good outcome most of the time. Even more dramatic... Uh, neonatal diabetes, only about 1,000 cases known across the globe so far. Uh, but if you have a kid diagnosed with diabetes less than six months old, they almost certainly do not have classical type 1 uh, diabetes. Uh, and they should be tested uh, for one of these rare mutations, often in the uh, KCNJ11 gene, the sulfonylurea receptor gene, uh, that uh, is ca can be causal for, for, for diabetes. Most of these kids are already on insulin, Turns out if they're diagnosed, uh, they can be placed on sulfonylureas and often get much better control on sulfonylureas than they did on insulin and often benefit in terms of some of the other uh, facets of the syndrome as well. So a beautiful example of personalized medicine. Uh, very rare. Now, you know, what I've told you, the pentry is a kind of nice picture of uh, these monogenic diseases where it's all very straightforward. Even here, actually, things get a bit blurred around the boundaries. You might think that uh, if you take a gene that's implicated in both type 2 diabetes and in uh, monogenic forms of diabetes, that you'd find uh, individuals who had really bad mutations would have a more severe phenotype, and those who had maybe a much more modest uh, 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 variant with a much more modest effect on, on the function of the gene would just have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And in fact, in a gene like HNF1-alpha, that does seem to be broadly true, uh, that there are a range of different mutations the really rare penetrant ones with big effects that are causal for MODI, uh, common uh, low effect uh, variants that are associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes, some ones in between, such as this one uh, that's present in about 1% of Hispanic individuals uh, that increases their risk of diabetes about five-fold. Well, actually, that hides a multitude of sins, and it, as anybody who's worked on these families will know, uh, you can often see very nice segregation in part of a family, but then you'll see individuals who are well past the typical age of presentation, who are either normal glycemic or only got diabetes uh, pretty late in life, and that diabetes looks very much like type 2 diabetes. And as we've got more and more sequence data, it turns out there are plenty of people wandering around, age 50, age 60, with normal glucose tolerance, but when you sequence them, they've got a, a MODI variant that in some families seems to be causal for diabetes. So there's something else going on. It's not even that clear that MODI can be that separated from type 2 diabetes all the time. 
So there's already blurring between Modi and type 2 diabetes. Uh, I won't say too much about the, the blurring between type 1 and type 2, um, but there's a question as to whether that, uh, what some people consider a separate type of diabetes larder is anything more than really just the overlap between uh, those two. But how will that play out in a disease like type 2 diabetes? Even if we accept that when you've got these monogenic forms of diabetes, you can do a pretty good job of a patient comes in and you put them in one bucket or other, um, could you do that uh, for type 2 diabetes? And for that, we have to go back to the, the genetics. As I told you, most of the genetic variants that we've identified in the last uh, few years are common variants of small effect. And we now have about 400 of them. I'm sure in a few years' time, we'll have 4,000 of them. They're scattered across the genome, and most of them are common. Many of you in this room will have, at many of these sites, diabetes risk alleles. At others, you'll have uh, maybe protective alleles. And so, actually, if I did have the sequence of all of you in this room, and I tested you for each of those 400 uh, variants, you'd all have your individual barcodes, which would be subtly different from... from uh, everybody else, but actually they'd be very strongly overlapping. So we're all swimming in this soup of common genetic factors, and we're also exposed to environmental factors that influence our risk of diabetes, which are probably pretty pervasive uh, uh, and cosmopolitan uh, because of the way diabetes are going up in multiple populations. So in that situation, it's pretty hard to conceive that you're going to have discrete subtypes of, of diabetes. Uh, overlapping risk factors essentially means overlapping disease. Now, one thing we can do, before I return to, to, to what that means for, for stratification within diabetes, is we can use the genetic information that we've got now increasingly uh, as a clinical tool. And this is something that really is going to, uh, I think, come of age in the next two, four, five years. With the genetic information we have for type 2 diabetes, we can explain about 20% of the overall variation in risk of diabetes. So there's another 80% we can't explain yet. About 20% of that is, is other genetic effects, which we probably will be able to capture as we get bigger and bigger studies. The other 60% is, of course, the non-genetic non factors that are explained through lifestyle and behavior and so on. But at least we can capture that genetic bit better and better. And for any individual, you in this room, anybody in the population, we can count up the number of risk alleles you've got at these 403 sites. You could have 806 if you're really unlucky. You could have zero if you're really lucky. Most people will be somewhere in the middle. It'd be normally distributed. And if we do that, we've done that. This is what, doing this in UK Biobank, a study of 500,000 uh, Europeans middle-aged uh, from UK, as you know. And if I go to UK Biobank, and I count up the number of risk alleles uh, across 500,000 people in the UK Biobank, and bin them, in this case, into 40 bins from the individuals who've got the fewest to those who've got the most. Uh, each of these, therefore, 2.5% of, the of that population. There's an almost tenfold difference in diabetes prevalence between them. So here's the average prevalence in UK Biobank, 4%. Top here, close to 11%. Bottom here, just above 1%. If that extrapolates to the uh, whole population, where the lifetime prevalence of type 2 is somewhere between 10 and 15% in the UK, um, that means there are actually over a million people in the UK who, on genetic grounds alone, have a close to 50% risk of type 2 uh, diabetes. Not 100%, because, of course, there's environmental factors in there as well. But that's way more people than have got monogenic forms of diabetes, which have also uh, uh, equivalent uh, kinds of uh, uh, risks. And potentially those are people who could be targeted uh, for, for interventions. Lots of questions, which I won't go into now, that we could ask about this and how it will roll out, how it will be played out, the uh, questions about uh, transethnic uh, portability and so on, which I'm sure we could answer in questions. But this is coming, and as more and more people are getting sequenced or genotyped, 13 million people in the States have been genotyped using either 23andMe or Ancestry.com. UK already uh, plans to do 5, maybe 10 million over the next uh, five, 5 to 10 years. So this is coming. This kind of information will be available and will inform uh, uh, not just diabetes, but, but lots of other common diseases.
Um, is this all pie in the sky? Well, actually, no. There's already one uh, uh, application that's already starting to be rolled out in some, some areas of the UK, which is not a type 2 diabetes risk score, but the same idea applied to, uh, to type 1 diabetes. Um, and the, the point here is that this can be quite useful in individuals who present with late onset diabetes uh, and who don't have the classical features of type 2 diabetes. If you do um, uh, the, both the type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes genetic risk score, you can pull out a set of people who've got very high type 1 diabetes risk, and they tend to be people who will have, be thinner and they'll have rapid deterioration of beta cell function and go on to insulin uh, uh, rapidly. And uh, in fact, you know, the, the prevalence of type 1 diabetes doesn't diminish in later life. It just simply becomes dwarfed by the large excess of type 2 diabetes. We mentioned our dear Prime Minister, at least Prime Minister for another day earlier, um, but she, she falls into this category. Uh, and some ne recent um, publications uh, uh, recently looking at how that type 1 diabetes risk score might be useful for, for prediction of uh, uh, type 1 diabetes. This is in kids from a uh, study called TEDI, taking children with uh, no uh, family history of type 1 diabetes but high-risk HLA genotypes and asking questions about uh, the extent to which a genetic score added on top of that, not uh, adding not the non-HLA components, can predict a development of a single islet autoantibody, multiple islet autoantibodies, or even type 1 diabetes. And you can see there's pretty good divergence of um, those uh, courses uh, based on the genetic risk score. So again, this could be useful as another predictive tool, maybe not population-wide, uh, but as you know, for recruitment into type 1 diabetes prevention uh, trials, for example. I would just want to finish off uh, in the last couple of minutes uh, that I've got, though, just going beyond this use of the um, overall risk score to predict diabetes and come back to that question of stratification within diabetes and different subtypes of diabetes. I think you could argue uh, that an overall risk score will help you obviously identify people at greatest future risk of diabetes, may help you separate out type 1 and type 2 uh, diabetes, but those are things for which you've got pretty good clinical um, uh, tools already. Where we really struggle in, in diabetes is identifying once somebody's got type 2 diabetes, will they progress? Will they be prone to complications? Which drugs would they most benefit from? And that's something we've been thinking about and, and trying to question whether diabetes, uh, genetics could help us there. Um, I, in passing, I thought I should just mention this paper came out in one of the Lancet journals six months ago. Many of you will see it. It had a big, uh, quite a lot of fanfare in the press claiming that you could use simple clinical parameters to group type 2 diabetes into different groups. This is not the time for... A, detailed critique of that, but fair to say that a number of individuals have, have made cogent points as to well, this may be largely artifactual or just a result of the way in the, the, the statistics were done. Um, but one, even if you believe in it, you, one thing to take from this is this was simply large groups of individuals and showing you could find some structure in it. It didn't show, and they have not been able to show that this would be clinically useful. In other words, if a patient came in and you measured uh, these variables that you'd be able to allocate them to one of these groups with any degree of confidence. So the way that we've been thinking about it is illustrated on this. Stop worrying about diabetes. Think about the processes that lead to diabetes. And we know diabetes is related to obesity, poor beta cell function, insulin resistance, some islet autoimmunity. These are all in the mix, and different individuals will have different degrees of them but they're all contributing to your risk of diabetes. And see each of those as a trait in itself, which has partly genetic and partly environmental factors. Now, and each of the, think of them as a series of sliders, and you can be low risk or high risk. Now, the extent to which there are, uh, how much of that is over to the right, on the whole, will tell you something about your diabetes risk, but which processes are over to the right will tell you something more about the type of diabetes, the clinical course, and the... Uh, maybe you know, the therapeutic uh, uh, options. Now, that, that idea fits clearly with the genetics. We can position different genetic variants in, in many of these processes that are, uh, we know or think are relevant to type 2 diabetes, showing that they are causal. And I could have shown you a slide in which I put different therapies for diabetes, and many of them act across this uh, uh, set of processes to, 
mitigate the effects of diabetes. Uh, what we've been able to do is, is use the genetics and pull apart different genetic subsets, subsets of those 403 genetic signals that work through these different processes. So we have a mini genetic risk score for obesity, a mini genetic risk score for beta cell dysfunction and so on. And to cut a long story short, I haven't got time to go into the details. When you do see, look at diabetes fragmented in that way, uh, deconstructed in that way, you do start to see differences, that not all diabetes risk alleles are having the same impact on the complications. I haven't got it on here. They don't have the, all the same impact on therapeutic response. So this is starting to be a way of thinking about using genetics alongside other bits of information to get at um, an understanding of what is driving diabetes in a given individual and thinking about what the, the consequences should be for, for clinical uh, outcomes. Now, genetics isn't everything. And clearly, even if we knew all the, what those genetic variants were doing, could measure them in individuals, something we could do fairly easily, I think, as the years go by, that's only one part of a component in which we want to feed in environmental information and an understanding of where somebody is at a given point. There'd be no point doing this if you didn't measure HbA1c and other variables. But the synthesis of all this will be a much more granular understanding of the f uh, processes involved in the development of diabetes in a given individual, uh, hopefully that'll have some play in terms of the way in which we manage those outcomes. So uh, let me finish there. I I'll, I'll, uh, won't go through the summary for reasons of time and uh, acknowledge the many people who have contributed to the work. And thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions. <laughs>